All right, it is the top of the hour, so we will go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's telehealth immersion program session focused on telehealth for primary care. Before getting started, we have just a couple housekeeping items. This session is a peer-to-peer -peer event and we highly encourage virtual engagement. You can start off by introducing yourself in the chat. If you'd like to type your name, role, the organization you're working with, and any questions that you might have or um, anything that you might be interested in learning about today specifically, we'd love to hear about that. Um, after each case study presentation, we reserve time for a live Q&A. If you have a question, please feel free to use the raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will invite you to ask your question live during these designated times. Since today's session is a Zoom meeting, we ask for your help in minimizing any disruption by keeping yourself on mute during the presentations and when you are not speaking. And lastly, this presentation will be recorded and made available on our program webpage following today's event. And without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Waldron. Dr. Stephen Waldron is the Vice President and Chief Medical Informatics Officer at the American Academy of Family Physicians. He is a nationally recognized expert in health information technology and has over 15 years of experience. Prior to joining AAFP, Dr. Waldron was a National Library of Medicine Medical Informatics Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Missouri, Columbia at which time Dr. Waldron earned a master's degree in medical informatics. Dr. Waldron is also a residency trained family physician. And besides his role at AAFP, he participates in many national healthcare informatics initiatives, such as being on the board of Logica Health, co-chair of Da Vinci Clinical Advisory Council, and past commissioner on the Federal Medicaid Payment and Access Commission. And with that, Dr. Waldron, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today and uh, chat with everybody. Um, I'll talk about this as kind of a view from family medicine, just because that's the data that I have. Um, but I think it's pretty representative of across all of primary care. Um, so the data that I have actually is two surveys that we did, one in May of 2020 and a follow-up in September of 2020. Um, we just completed another survey um, that just finished uh, about a week ago. So I looked at that and make sure there wasn't anything that would uh, invalidate uh, any of those prior survey data that I have, but I won't really talk about that particular uh, survey. So, um, and those surveys that we had in May and September had about 200, uh, a little over 200 in each of those, um, those surveys. Let's see if I can get the next slide to go. Um, one thing that I think is really important to understand is that uh, primary care provided what I call kind of a high G maneuver uh, back at the start of the, the pandemic. Um, you know, you think about a high G maneuver in an aircraft, it provides, puts on a lot of stress on the technology, it also puts a lot of stress on the pilot. And I think that was very true of the early days of the pandemic uh, back in uh, even as, as late as May in the pandemic. Um, in primary care and family medicine, at least we had about 15% of our members that were doing telehealth prior to the pandemic. But at that time in May, another 81% had added uh, some type of virtual visits to their office. So well above 90%, um, around 94%. And our September numbers put that at 97%. So um, I think the vast majority of primary care adopted the technology uh, to try to support the needs of their, of their patients. Um, and I think <clears throat> there were a lot of trends that we saw during this, this transition. Um, a lot of utilization of audio only for a lot of issues around the, from the technology adoption for broadband issues, from uh, patient um, acceptance of being able to figure out how to do it well. Um, but I think even as late as September found that there's still a significant high value uh, uh, providing kind of audio only telehealth visits uh, to patients. So definitely from our perspective, the AAP will continue to promote and advocate for the, uh, the payment of audio only uh, as a valid uh, utilization methodology in primary care. Uh, one anecdotal piece that I will say though, I've talked with a couple of our docs that have done uh, the audio only and one of the concerns they have is that uh, with the video visit, you can still do your non-verbals just like you do in an in-person visits to kind of keep patients on time and to let them understand that um, you, know, you have a limited amount of time that you could uh, spend with a patient. Um, those are not able to be done in audio only. So 
we talked about our docs saying that those audio only seem to uh, last a little bit longer than than the video visit sometimes. So um, just keep that in mind. I'm sure you're uh, experiencing that well in your in your practice. We did say a high level of satisfaction. So back in May, uh, if you think about the, 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 they said that they were either moderately or highly satisfied with it. Uh, it was about 80% that said that they were um, satisfied with the technology and with the adoption of the telehealth in their practice. Um, and you think back in May of the, the, the challenges that we all had in trying to get this new technology into practices um, and still seeing that high level of satisfaction that was really remarkable for me when I looked at the data. And we saw that very similar type of data with a, a larger number now highly satisfied with the technology with the telemedicine in their practice. <clears throat> so I think there's also this strong desire to continue leveraging telehealth post pandemic. Uh, so about 76% of our members had in those surveys said they wanted to continue to deliver telehealth in the post pandemic. So I, I think with the increase in um, uh, desire on the patient side and the satisfaction on the physician side and the, the payment starting to happen, I think we'll continue to see a, a significant uh, continuation of telehealth and primary care. Um, but I think well, two of the challenges there are, one is this um, significant utilization of consumer tools to provide the video visits. Um, and with the pandemic, of course, there's the relaxation of the enforcement of HIPAA um, so while I think a lot of our docs use technology that were more consumer focused, that were highly secure, they didn't have the level of the you know, business associate agreement. And so they could not be a, a HIPAA compliant utilization. Um, so now they're trying to contemplate, well, what should I, should I use? And we had, a, I would say, a, almost over a quarter of our docs using some type of consumer technology. And they'll have to make that transition uh, post pandemic when those relaxations of HIPAA are discontinued. And then between May and September, and that's continued in our latest survey of our members, just a significant decrease in the number of telemedicine visits um, by volume. And I think that's definitely because of the increase in the number of in-person visits in the last uh, several months because of the decreased uh, um, uh, lockdowns that we had to have in uh, across the nation, which are all great things. Um, I don't have good data to know kind of what the post-pandemic volumes would be, but all the anecdotal information and talking with experts, the the numbers that I've heard around is somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of visits will continue to be tele telehealth or virtual uh, moving forward after the pandemic. We saw in May about an average of about 28 to 29 uh, visits per week that were being done by telehealth and only 19 in September. So a significant decrease from that May to September timeframe. Right, payers are also really embracing the technology. Back in May, about 40, over 40% 40 of our members were doing telehealth and not getting paid to do it by plans. Um, and that's well over 90% um, by time of September that uh, we're getting paid to do the telehealth. So, uh, and we've seen a lot of uh, signals in the marketplace that um, they want to continue. Medicare has set some really good signals um, in the physician fee schedule this year. Um, and uh, the plans have also in the private sector have sent those good signals. I think one of the challenges moving forward is this new kind of virtual only insurance products that are entering into the market. And what does that mean? Um, and we're also seeing a lot of the large plans are really investing heavily in kind of standalone telehealth companies. Um, so for us, I think one of the challenges is this direct to consumer. While we're seeing that significant investment in VCs in addition to those large plans and startups, and we're seeing them being very aggressive in the way that they expand um, in the marketplace. The question, though, is uh, will that get us a more uh, fragmentation in primary care and uh, loss of continuity and coordination, which we know are two of the big uh, components to really driving value in, in primary care, in addition to first access, which I think these type of solutions um, have a potential to improve. But then the other, of course, fourth C of primary care is that comprehensiveness, 
which also is, I think, a challenge if that telehealth is not being provided by a patient's usual source of primary care. So I think that'll be one of the ongoing uh, you know, issues we'll have to deal with as a, as a nation of, of making that balance between making sure there's great access to telehealth um, and, and choice for patients, but also at the same time making sure that we're not degrading that longitudinal care for the patient around that continuity and care coordination. So for us and thinking about how do we at the AAP help our members grow telehealth and primary care, you know, we need appropriate payment. So we, we, and I know the AMA has done this as well as continue to advocate for uh, current payment policies post pandemic. Um, we're also seeing that our docs that are in some type of value-based payment where they have a prospective payment, um, that they're able to uh, integrate innovation into their practice significantly uh, more easily than, than fee for service. And we saw that during the pandemic with our folks that are doing either direct primary care or a high uh, value-based uh, payment arrangement, we're able to in integrate telehealth uh, sooner. Um, there's a lot of challenges. So I mentioned that uh, survey that we just did, we focused in a lot of the challenges that our members have. Um, and they have a lot of challenges just navigating the payment policy, understanding what they can and can't do as it relates to getting paid. Um, the other is understanding the clinical appropriateness. So what should I or should I not do via, via telehealth? And the lastly is what I call kind of op optimizing operations. So how do I really integrate this into my workflow? How do I co-mingle in-person and virtual visits um, in my practice? Uh, and how do I do it effectively and efficiently? And how do I onboard patients really well? Um, so I think in the pandemic, a lot of our doctors say like, well, we know how to do it now because we've been baptized by fire. But how do we do it well and do it efficiently? And that's where we'll be trying to focus our efforts. And then lastly, I think there's a, a need to continue to build the evidence around the quality and value of telehealth as we move forward. Uh, because I think in, in my view, telehealth today and in the post pandemic is not gonna be the same as telehealth in the pre pandemic world. So all the evidence that we have in the pre pandemic world uh, I don't think it's going to be adequate because we're adding a lot of chronic disease management and additional primary care services that are being delivered by telehealth today and tomorrow that they just weren't developed, uh, excuse me, deployed like that in the pre-pandemic world. So for me, I think about um, a couple of things. So while we've not seen that, we won't see that sustained levels of telehealth that we have now in the post-pandemic, but the levels of uh, telehealth in the it's gonna be significantly higher than it was in the pre-pandemic. So in my view, telehealth is and will be a prominent component of primary care moving forward. The question is, is how do we do it well and how do we integrate it um, so that we continue the four C's of primary care, uh, first access, first contact, um, care coordination, continuity of care, and make sure that we're doing comprehensive care and primary care, which we all know is uh, where the value in primary care is. So I look forward to the uh, other two case studies and the questions at the end. So thank you very much. I don't think we can hear you, Bernadette. Can you hear me? Okay, apologies for that. Uh, we have just a minute here. Um, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Waldron, uh, we invite you to use the raise hand function and we'll just wait a minute before moving on. All right, and it's so nice to see everyone introducing themselves in the chat. Um, we even have someone joining us from Thailand, which is great. So thank you so much. Keep that going in the chat. We will, I will introduce our next speech speaker without further ado, Dr. Sakumoto. Dr. Sakumoto is a primary care physician at Terra Practice, a virtual first primary care practice in the Sutter Health Network in San Francisco. He is a fellowship trained, he's fellowship trained in clinical informatics with a focus on virtual care. And prior to joining Terra Practice, Dr. Sakimoto has also worked as a virtualist for telehealth startups, including Teladoc and Plush Care. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Super excited to say that. I see a lot of international participants, so very excited to see that as well. Uh, let's see, let me do, I'm not sure if I'm able to do 
control the screen here. Actually, I, I can just call it out. If you could do the next slide. Perfect. Um, so like I said, uh, Matt Sakamoto, a primary care virtualist and clinical informaticist at Sutter. You can go to the next slide. Uh, just some quick disclosures. Like I said, um, I'll mention a bunch of different specific vendors, but this does not imply any endorsement from my end, and then my views don't represent that of my employer. Next slide. Thinking through the roadmap, I really kind of want to share high-level experiences um, from Sutter, but also it's in my prior roles at some of the other companies that were mentioned. Um, and I'll be talking through components of the virtual primary care stack, but I, I wanted to keep this front end high-level and really kind of save time for questions to do deep dives um, to really let the audience guide uh, things that you want to know more about. Uh, next slide. So just uh, in terms of, I, I like to utilize the chat um, feature. So in, in addition to introducing yourself, I kind of want to know, like, you know, what is your role? Seems like we have a lot of uh, clinicians on board uh, today, but if you're manager, patient um, as well, kind of what is your role? And then really on a scale of one to 10, what's your experience been with uh, primary virtual care? And then sort of the bonus question is, would you pick a primary care doctor that you would never get a chance to meet in person? Um, and really seeing how far we can push the boundaries of what we define as virtual primary care. Um, so look forward to kind of seeing what that chat looks like, and we can circle back to some of those discussion points uh, during the discussion time. Next slide, please. So for virtual primary care, and I loved uh, Steve's kind of setup for this, it's my favorite framework is uh, by Zeev Newworth over at Atrium, and it's a reframing of primary care. So we kind of use it as like a monolithic dumping ground for hospital follow-ups and coordinating care between specialists. But as you can see, if you discretize out some of these things, there's actually ways to, again, as Steve was mentioning, optimize um, what we're doing, how to provide the right type of care, the right type of uh, modality for the right patient. And all of these things can be powered by um, what I slash Julie Yu calls the virtual tech, uh, virtual first tech stack. So there's different components that can create this coordinating platform. And I'll talk about um, what I've seen and what I've seen uh, to, to work. Next slide, please. So for Terra practice, uh, Dr. Yumi Taylor actually developed this over three years ago. So she was way ahead of the curve. Uh, the model was developed back in 2018 through Sutter as a virtual first practice serving the Palo Alto kind of Stanford area. It's team-based care and it's always been team-based care. So as you can see, it's the primary care doctor, there's a nurse practitioner, um, a nurse and a health coach, all really um, serving the patient. And again, it's a virtual first manner. So we do 90% of our care by messaging, video, audio, but I, um, we also all have, I have a half day of clinic uh, that I can see my patients in person if needed, if they want to, and if it's needed. Um, and the, they're really trying to prove out that the model is replicable and scalable. So their initial setup was at, uh, in Palo Alto near Stanford, uh, but I am leading up the San Francisco city uh, expansion. And I think they're up to three pods now. So it's really kind of testing to see how, how does this model work across uh, at least the California region. Next slide, please. Theme of today's talk, uh, Legos and layers. Um, and the main thing I want to stress is while it's taken over three years for the Terra practice to kind of scale out to the practice it is today, I want to stress that practices of any size uh, can start with just basic building blocks. So you take early wins, you build out your communications infrastructure, both with the patient and with your virtual back office or, or office demonstrate some value and then you can add on um, as you get wins you can add on layers either through your through your health system through the pairs and, and, and things like that so the three areas i want to focus on today at least are again patient communication uh, the virtual back office of so what does that care communication look like uh, on the back end and then what hybrid care looks like next slide please um, so and the thing about the virtual clinic workflows so this is a busy looking slide but main things i want to uh, focus on is that looking at how much work happens in the pre-visit. So the virtual visit itself is maybe 15 minutes, but there's a lot of things that have to happen up front and really encouraging everybody to focus on both the pre and post as well as what actually happens um, in the direct communication between the provider and the patient. Next slide. So thinking through the continuum, virtual care, at least to me, is not just video visits. And uh, Steve mentioned as well, audio is a large component, but it's really a whole spectrum of communication. And I wanna highlight really everything from texting, um, sending pictures in a store and forward manner. And the two things, if you look on the left side versus the right side is how the technical human and um, technical and human resources increase as you move from left to right. So you're kind of needing more time and more direct uh, resources as you move from texting to telepresenter. And if you look across the bottom, the way that they split as well as asynchronous messaging um, and modalities really allow for multitasking and team-based care. I'll, I'll do a deeper dive on this when I talk through kind of how we provide team-based care, but that really allows for scaling out of time. Um, 
On the flip side, the synchronous um, modes of communication, so phone calls, video visits, allow for more high fidelity um, conversation, but also uh, that time is spent with you know one patient minute for minute. Next slide. So thinking through website management, so how do you improve connection through a video screen or through the phone? And I just want to stress that this topic in and of itself is an, actually an hour-long lecture that I give. So I'll start with some of the high-yield topics, but definitely happy to do deeper dives again when we go into the discussion section. A couple of things like how do you create connection at a distance? Um, one model that I use is the telepresence five, uh, developed by Abraham Verghese out of Stanford, but really thinking of how to center yourself and the patient prior to and during each visit. So preparing um, for the visit, listening to the patient, agreeing on an agenda, making that connection with the patient, and really exploring what's most important to the patient. Um, principles that work well in person, but I think are even more important when you're in a, a virtual conversation. And the other thing, too, is just thinking through webcam placement and lighting. Um, a lot of connection is done through eye contact, so making sure that where your video screen is, where your webcam is, and how you're interacting with the patient really makes a difference. Lighting, um, same thing, both for the patient and for the provider. So these are just small things that actually have a pretty large impact um, when, it, when it comes to connecting and communicating with, with patients. Next slide, please. And the final element I want to highlight is that virtual care has kind of revived the home visit. So um, one thing that I want to add is that I've actually added an environmental scan as part of my note template. So what that allows me to do is I can see family photos, um, just kind of what is the uh, home environment that the patient's in, home and, and or work environment, but it gives you a, a little better sense than kind of the clinical environment when you only see a patient in your in the clinic room. And even for myself, another thing I'll point out is um, in the same way that I can share uh, in a patient's home, I rarely use a virtual background for myself, as you can even see here. Um, so when I work out of my home office, it, it allows for that same level of, I think, uh, personal connection. Um, so you can see either art on the walls or things that I have uh, in the background. So th these are two, again, ways that I think you can connect on a personal level and, and build some empathy with the patient in that way. Next slide. So that's, I kind of covered quickly the patient provider interaction, but the virtual back office is actually something that is new uh, with, with the pandemic. So how do you keep that coordination with your team, uh, with, with your care team and clinical team uh, in a virtual world? Next slide. So one way to or that we've really found to improve communication is to hold space for the daily huddle. So in the uh, in-person clinic days, you know, we all, we'd often huddle around a board, kind of talk about what patients are coming up for the day, what things were needed. Um, and, and again, it really helps to make team-based care work. So we have our four members of our team um, that are there. Next slide. And we take this and do it in a Zoom world. So we have a huddle board um, in the same way here. And during the review of the huddle board, we also really focus on data-driven decision-making. So we have many reports that we're um, reviewing on a daily to weekly basis, be it uh, our patient panels of utilization, any health equity opportunities, care gaps um, that need closing for hypertension or diabetes management. So all of these things allow us to stay in touch as an office, but also um, uh, while doing it all remotely. Next slide. And the final point I wanna make is that Terra is a virtual first, not virtual only practice. This level of hybridity I think is super important and something to think about um, because it's hard to uh, provide virtual care purely in, in, in the virtual realm. Next slide. So particularly during the pandemic and all the shelter in place, learning how to provide continuity of care at a distance was very important. And as, as you all know, many elements of care still require physical interface with the healthcare system. So we found ways to connect with mental health with the patients from their couch rather than our couch, um, using uh, remote uh, patient monitoring tools for diabetes and hypertension management, a lot of home monitoring from that standpoint. And the other thing that I really want to stress is kind of the partnerships that we have, again, within the Sutter system, it's a large um, health network, but partnerships with our walk-in clinics, with some of the standalone labs, and having my own clinic days to really provide that care, um, in-person care, if needed for the patients. Next slide. So as you can see, many components um, that I kind of went through, but each of these things are pretty modular. That's why I like to use the Lego analogy. So you can kind of pick which ones are most important and then slowly build on top of those kind of over the course of months to years um, and really tailor which ones you think are most important for your practice and your patient population. Um, let's see, next slide. The last thing I wanna stress, and this is circling back to 
going to some of those asynchronous um, asynchronous methodologies and team-based care is time can help make up for some of the touch um, that is missing in a virtual interaction. So traditional primary care, healthcare in general, tends to be pretty episodic and fee for service. And the barriers for follow-up often include lack of patient and provider time and rapidly accruing co-pays for the frequent check-ins. So in the virtual care environment, this time can make up for the touch. For example, if a patient has a cough or a sore throat, I don't have to make that decision at the end of that 15 minute visit for should I get a chest x-ray, should I um, prescribe antibiotics, I can actually wait and let the disease declare itself with some of these frequent check-ins. So with virtual check-ins, I can um, potentially avoid kind of unnecessary care, unnecessary x-rays, unnecessary antibiotics, and sort of um, let time be, be the judge. On the flip side, kind of on the less acute things, chronic care management, uh, interstitial care, so I call the stuff between the stuff. Usually we see a patient every three months, every six months to see how they're doing. Having virtual options to, for outreach to the patient really allows for proactive monitoring and probably course correction and or changes if needed at a sooner pace than again, our, our Q3 month check-ins. So I think uh, virtual care really opens up and creates time um, in, in different ways. So that's the one reason why I really focus on that, particularly the asynchronous modalities. Next slide. And again, that 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 really um, makes my point there. So kind of just to recap, um, and again, I really like this return on health framework that the AMA has uh, putting together. So kind of mapping Terra onto this frame, uh, let's see if you can click once. So the environmental variables that we have, actually, so it's important to uh, note. So we do adult primary care. We only take HMO insurance. So that helps a lot with thinking through what the cost savings are and gives us that flexibility to think through adding on the health coach and, and additional um, health benefits for the patient. And we have a diverse complex patient population for sure. Next slide. And this is our tech stack. So um, again, happy to talk through each of these. So this is what we use. We're on Epic um, at, as a system here. Canton and Zoom are our video platform. Jabber is what we use for phone. Um, and most of our messaging with the patient is through Epic MyChart. Uh, next slide. And finally, what does this virtual care value stream look like for us? So we have data-driven daily huddles. So a lot of our clinical quality metrics are looked at and looked at closely, and we're actively and proactively working on those. Um, we have very uh, increased access for the patients. So they can message us, phone, video, and in-person um, for the patients across our region. And then very high satisfaction. I, I can personally say I'm very satisfied working there, and our patients also have given us uh, uh, good satisfaction surveys. And then the financial impact. So even just kind of increasing um, emergency room visits, uh, working on our pay for performance goals and quality metrics have, have had a positive financial impact as well. Let's see, next slide. So with that, I'll pause. I know I went through a lot of stuff, but I did kind of want to just give a high level on the front end and really allow for audience questions to drive the rest of the discussion. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Dr. Sakamoto. Um, we welcome any questions at this time. You may wel you're welcome to raise your hand and ask your question live or type it in the chat and, um, and I can verbally ask Dr. Sakamoto on your behalf. So we'll just wait for a couple of questions to come through. And in the meantime, I think, you know, just question for you from me, you know, as a, as a virtualist, what are some key takeaways? Like if you just had to give someone just, you know, three tips, on you know key key things for a successful visit, like what would those be? I think uh, to be honest, it's don't rush it. So I think it's one of those things where like this was my transition as well. So it's like one, don't rush it. So uh, you can go back for that repeat visit. Like the barrier for a follow up is pretty low. Um, so I think embracing that and, and being okay with it. And then two is just get really, really good at history taking skills. So there's, there's a level of, of, you know, it used to be the history and physical exam, and we don't have much of the physical exam. Um, so really honing in on the uh, ability to take a good history and ask questions in a different way, I, I think was another big learning point. And then the third one would be to learn new elements of the virtual physical exam. So I think for me in, in the same way, I've probably done about 2000 hours worth of uh, virtual care over the last year and a half or so. And it, it's a learned skill. I mean, it, it kind of felt like medical school in the same way that you kind of feel more comfortable, you do enough of different um, virtual exam maneuvers and it takes practice. And then just follow up to that, um, you know, from a workflow perspective, how are you collecting that information? Are you like asking patients that in advance or right before the visit? Do you have a care team member that, you know, signs on a few minutes early to ask those questions? Um, anything around workflow that you might want to share? Yeah, for sure. And kind of going back to that, thinking about like, you know, that uh, 
busy graphic I had, what, what does that clinic, virtual clinic workflow look like? That pre-work makes such a big difference. So one, having a team to do that, we have a pre-visit questionnaire that goes through a lot of these things. So the patient kind of mostly med recs themselves um, and highlights any concerns and um, things that they want prior to the visit starting. So I kind of have a head start in thinking about what, what that might be. Um, we don't tech check with our with our MAs, but that's something to think about as well for a patient's first time to have that five minute period be like a, make sure that they can connect. Um, but once, once, once they're on, I, I, I tend to room my own patients. So those are probably the biggest ones is really utilizing that pre-visit time. And that, that takes a lot of work because you want to make sure that the patient has a messaging interface that you can message them with and that they're checking it. Um, but we, that's another area that we spend a lot of time doing is making sure that um, patients my chart access is turned on and helping them through that. Awesome. All right, we got a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, one from Anthony Holbert. Can you speak more about your experiences with hybrid care in partnership with urgent care clinics? Yes. Um, so again, I've wandered the wilderness a bit. So I've, I've done a bunch of different models. I think the best ones are when you have a partnership, when they can see your records. The biggest one I've heard from patients is if you kind of send them to a urgent care clinic versus a urgent care clinic that you have a relationship with is they feel like they have to retell their story um, when, when they get there, um, if, if we have to refer in. So the upside again of Sutter is that um, we exist within kind of a large health network. So we're on all on the same version of Epic. Um, so if they go in, they can see my note um, and that saves a lot of time. A couple other hybrid clinics I worked at, worked at the same thing, right? It's like you can send them into a physical location that can see the record. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest one. And I, I did feel that disconnect when I worked on some other startup platforms that again, to Steve's point, caused a little bit of fragmentation of care because I saw them, I give my recommendation, but there's not that um, handoff to, to the in-person. So if and when you can integrate it, maybe direct integration of EHR, or um, having a way to at least send your progress note to them um, on the way in is, is, is hugely helpful. And I think a big patient satisfier as well. Yeah, definitely lots of work in progress and you know ways to optimize in the future. Um, we have another question. How do you identify an, an, an optimal panel size? For sure, I know that's always a tough one. Uh, to be honest, it it's, depends on the team size and the team structure, right? So for myself, um, I mean, some traditional primary care panels go as high as like three, four, five thousand patients. Um, but it depends on one, the complexity of the patients that you have, and then two, the team that you're surrounded with. So for myself, I have myself, a nurse practitioner, and a nurse. So we can actually expand pretty big. I think our current one, Yumi's panel, Dr. Taylor's panel is, is kind of the original, and I think she goes up like 2,500 patients. So you can, um, and, but you can expand that out if you add additional nurse practitioners to your team or the way that you um, kind of slice and dice it. And obviously, if you have very complex patients, that total number of patients is going to go down, but then, you know, the complexity is up. Awesome. We have another question. And Dr. Waldron, I don't know if you're still on, I think maybe I'll, I'll pitch this one to you. Um, we've got a question around just statistics on patient satisfaction, as well as clinical satisfaction in regards to receiving, providing virtual care. So any insight from your end? Yeah, so let me ask, let me answer the patient one first. That's the one I can't answer as well. Um, so in our surveys, both in May and September, we asked our members how they think they're, how satisfied their patients were. And it was about 80% that when they said that their patients were satisfied. So again, that's kind of secondhand um, and their interpretation of that. So uh, put a, a little grain of salt relative to, to that answer. On the physician side, then, you know, in our in our May timeframe, 74% said they were either somewhat or high or very satisfied. And in September, that was 78%. So not a lot of change regards to who was satisfied or not. But as you look at the difference between somewhat satisfied and very satisfied, so very satisfied in May was 17%. And in September, it was 26%. So I think we saw an increase in the, the level of kind of very satisfied. Um, and again, these were folks, I would say, in a traditional kind of primary care practice, adding telehealth, um, as opposed to, you know, folks that were a virtualist only. So also use that as kind of a, a grain of salt as well. But uh, I think we've seen high levels of satisfaction um, across the board. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And just to add, it's somewhat, you know, somewhat similar, but we've asked questions. So there's a, I can share this also in the chat as a resource, the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition. Um, and we asked questions around what's your interest in continuing to receive care in the future? 
Um, so somewhat similar, but we do have high right, percentages around patients being interested in receive, continuing to receive care virtually um, in a variety of settings. So thank you, Dr. Waldron, for that. Um, all right, a couple of more questions for you, Dr. Sakamoto. We have- Bernadette, I think uh, Snehal yes. had one up, up top as well, uh, prior to- Oh, go ahead, go one. for so, it. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this real quick. So any recommended model for evaluation of telemedicine with regards to quality improvement? Actually, if you wouldn't mind either coming off mute or uh, dropping in the chat, what do you mean in terms of uh, traditional quality improvement or like quality metric reporting? Uh, so, Dr. Sakamoto, hello. Uh, this is Nehal. So, okay. in terms of the overall quality improvement from uh, from the care receivers as well as the care providers, and I'm really focusing on the educational model that we have implemented from last semester, which is a telemedicine model, which is educational model for medical students, and they are visiting an ambulatory clinic here on Barbados. So we are trying to look for the tools or kind of rubrics or any system which can lead to quality improvement of overall program. Got it. No, excellent question. Um, I'd say so. The, some of the other work I do is with UCSF and the, the and across the board. I'd say the use of telemedicine for just education in general, I think, has really led to interesting uh, shadowing opportunities and just kind of ways to get involved that like. Um, students couldn't get, get in before. So I think there are a lot of ways to plug telemedicine into quality improvement. Um, no specific ones off the top of my head, but yeah, if, also feel free to reach out um, uh, offline because I think there's, I'll think about this a little bit more, but there's a lot of opportunity there, again, particularly in the uh, med ed realm for uh, telemedicine and incorporating that. And I would just add on the education piece. I know the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine just published a a new telehealth curriculum, uh, at least they're piloting it right now in several different residencies. Uh, and I think there's a module there on quality too. So if you want to check that out, you can hit me up if you can't find it. Yeah. Oh, and, and like I mentioned too, like um, our daily huddles, that's basically quality improvement every day, right? There's um, our, our different metrics that we're looking at and reviewing. So I'm sure there's a way to, again, incorporate either shadowing of medical students into that and or having them take on pieces of that, you know, do report outs on that. And I see Blake's question here. Also, hello, Blake. Um, and that goes actually really nicely into Dr. George's portion of it. I, I personally don't really use that many peripherals um, specifically. Um, we have a couple of partnerships with kind of Apple Health Kit and on Duo in terms of kind of doing some blood pressure monitoring and diabetes monitoring, but no kind of specific ones. Actually, I'm super excited to see Dr. George's presentation as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Dr. George might be able to help answer that one too. All right, um, and then Dr. Sakamoto, I think only one person responded around your, your initial questions that you had mm -hmm. asked around um, if they would be interested in um, their comfortability around seeing a, a physician that uh, they've never met in person. I think it was a, kind of a lukewarm. They weren't, they weren't totally sure if they would be interested. Um, but personally, from my end, you know, I've had great experiences um, meeting virtual physicians, and I think sometimes just convenience and access sometimes outweighs, you know, the wait times that are more present in, in, in seeing someone in, in a in-person sense. So that's just my two cents. Thank Not you. sure if anyone has anything else to add there. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions come through. Um, Dr. Sakamoto, any final comments before moving to our next speaker? No, no specific ones. I said that. I, I, I love the chats more than the, the talk part itself. So thanks everyone for engaging. Yes. And um, yeah, again, welcome anyone who's brave enough to share their video or, you know, uh, turn on their audio during the Q&A portion. So we, we absolutely encourage that. All right. Um, our next speaker, I'm in incredibly excited to introduce Dr. Diane George. Dr. George is the Chief Medical Officer for Henry Ford Medical Group Primary Care. She oversees close to 300 primary care physicians and advanced practice providers in clinic, virtual, home, work, and skilled nursing facility settings. Her focus is on the development of value-based care models that facilitates ex excellent results, better serves our diverse patient population, improves the work environment for staff, and enables growth. Dr. George is a graduate of Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed her residency at MSU and is a board certified family medicine. Thank you, Dr. George, and I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I actually requested control, but it looks like it's not working. So I will have you forward for me. All right, well, I am super excited to be here and actually very glad that I got to hear Dr. Sak Sakamoto's uh, presentation. Very much food for thought uh, for me. And once you uh, start to hear where we are, um, you'll understand why that is. Next slide, please. So Henry Ford Medical Group, um, to those of you who may not um, know us, uh, we are based out of Southeast Michigan and, um, and thereby have a, a lot of patients who are really um, in difficult uh, circumstances. So as we design, we try to think about how are we gonna improve care across the continuum uh, for all of our patients, those who uh, have that flexibility to, um, to go wherever they want and those who are, might be very ill and trapped in their homes and you'll sort of see that. Um, I'm gonna give a brief overview of our approach and our journey, but really brief because um, we could talk for a long time. We have about 300 primary care physicians and we are really trying to do something uh, that, uh, that, that, that we can apply across the board for all of our patients, um, but um, also using that segmented approach that uh, Dr. Sakamoto was talking about, you'll see that reflected in these slides as well. We'll talk a little bit about challenges and solutions and then spend most of the time really looking at what is a device enabled exam? Why are we doing it? Um, and uh, how does it actually work? What's the experience like for the, the provider as well as for the patient? Next slide, please. So our guiding principles uh, at Heaven Ford Medical Group Primary Care, when it comes to things that we do virtually or things that we do in person really is we wanna align around the quadruple uh, aim. We want to make sure that we're integrated across the continuum. In fact, that's kind of our secret sauce. You know, if you're a medical group um, and, and you don't integrate, you, you missed an opportunity. So we really want our patients to wanna to use us for telehealth, for urgent care, et cetera, and for all of their care rather than fragmenting their care um, and going elsewhere. The integration of the EHR is really fundamental. We've had experience in trying things like we partnered with, uh, with a, a telehealth company in the very, very early days and our docs participated, uh, but we had low uptake with our patients and it didn't integrate into the EMR and um, very, it wasn't perceived as very high value. Um, safety and clinical approach, appropriateness are really prime concerns. Um, we also see this as consumerism and value interdigitate when it comes to, uh, to, um, to virtual care um, because you can provide care that is, is, is appropriate at a, high, at a, a lower cost um, and more convenience and better experience for the patient if you choose correctly. Uh, so there's a consumerism piece to it as well as a value uh, piece. Uh, we do strive for radical convenience as well as radical personalization. And as we go forward in uh, virtual care or digital health, you can, I see the future becoming more and more personalized. We're gonna stick with the things in green today for the most part, but you'll probably hear echoes of some of the other things um, as we talk today. Next slide, please. So what does integrating across the care continuum mean for us? So I'll start with on-demand care. We have walk-in clinics and urgent care. They are all integrated into our EMR. It's all Henry Ford Medical Group. Um, we developed some time ago, uh, My Care On Demand, it's 24 seven um, virtual visits with a physician. And we chose at that time not to use nurse practitioners or PAs because we didn't want to limit artificially the use case. We didn't want to say it can only be used for these kinds of conditions. And we found, um, as Dr. Sakamoto was uh, talking about, you have to have a very high uh, clinical index of suspicion. You have to uh, really understand what questions you need to ask and uh, that, that experience that physicians have. Uh, it gave us security that we weren't going to be bridging any, any uh, boundaries here in, in terms of safety. Uh, so that could change in the future as we develop and create more um, um, sort of uh, digital navigation so patients can you know, get, get in with the right people, but for now that's how it is. 
And then we developed rapid response e-visits. So that's another version of on-demand care. You, I'm sure all know what e-visits are. They're asynchronous visits, really probably underutilized and very much loved by patients. And we'll do, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the rapid response e-visits um, in a little bit, but those are done with the first available person. The school-based employer base, we have providers on site. That was our original model. And now we're really shifting more to the only person on site is a medical assistant who can do vitals, who can do immunizations and things like that that employers um, want and employees need. Um, but we've, um, you, we're usually using the virtual exam kit on site and then doing visits with our on-demand docs. Um, then there's that continuity care, traditional continuity care, and pe people can do in person, obviously scheduled uh, with or without the exam kit e-visits. And we have 100% integrated uh, virtual behavioral health uh, across all of all 300 of us in Henry Ford Medical Group Primary Care. Um, then lastly, there's this what we call complex primary care services and that mobile integrated health is really part of that. Uh, even though I gave its own banner there just because uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. We had comprehensive care centers and well as well as home visiting physicians to serve these more fragile folks. But first we we decided, well, we need more less windshield time and more interaction time for our home visiting physicians. And so uh, we started incorporating more bit virtual and it really doubled their reach. We could uh, impact more patients that way. And then we added that with the uh, comprehensive care centers as well. Um, we use an MA or a, or, or a CHW as a telepresenter and those are done um, with a device that enables the exam. And the mobile integrated health is with paramedics who go into the home they do, they telepresent, they provide treatment, and they partner with a remote physician. And these, this is a different group of physicians than the on-demand docs uh, because they have, have to be very familiar with dealing with people who uh, have high acuity needs, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more as well. Next slide, please. All right, so the rapid response e-visit. Um, you know, we really didn't know when we went live with this um, that it was going to be impactful to our patients. These are safe, convenient, and integrated, and it provides really high quality, convenient interaction. We, it's less than a two, around, two hour turnaround time, and it uses our on-demand physician pool. So we, we um, who by the way, are mostly docs who also have regular clinic time. They, they just do this as part of their FTE. We quietly turned it on in my chart and patients loved it. They found it themselves. Uh, they clicked on that and they were provided when they went in to look to do an e-visit with a choice to do a rapid response e-visit, getting a uh, less than two hour turnaround with whoever was next in line, or what, whichever physician was up, or they could send the message to their PCP if they had one and um, get a turnaround within one business day. And clearly people wanted two hour turnaround because with no promotion at all, just with people finding it and within my chart, we did f over 550 in, in the first six weeks and it continues to be um, very popular. So this is what Bernadette was talking about. Sometimes convenience trumps knowing the person, but these also can be highly personal and the, 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 the uh, um, story that you can see here at the bottom of the screen really illustrates how being interconnected with the EMR actually made this better. So this is a patient who has a Henry Ford Medical Group primary care physician. They launched an e-visit because they were feeling really tired in the morning and feeling nauseous. The doc did a really quick review of the EPIC record, which he could do quickly and in detail, and found that trazodone would have been prescribed with a starting dose of 100 milligrams, which any clinician on the line knows could cause those symptoms. Um, and the, the physician advised lowering the dose um, and, and then following up with her PCP um, after that, but once she was used to the low dose. Well, she was very grateful for this quick turnaround, um, but then replied back that the next morning she still felt nauseous. And so another doctor was covering the pool and, um, and provided that work note that she needed um, based on the documentation of the previous doctor. So that, that I think is a really good illustration of the convenience, the safety, and the integration. Uh, and we'll, we'll go further, I think, into um, doing some more of these asynchronous or chat type visits in the future. Next slide, please. 
So a couple more rapid response visit stories. Um, I won't spend a lot of time here, but the first one is a person who they had only been to a, a walk-in clinic. Uh, they were struggling with GERD symptoms and the walk-in clinic had recommended over-the-counter PPIs, but symptoms seemed to be progressing. He did not have a, a PCP, so he was um, referred to one that was close to, her, to his home. The, the next one is somebody who has had re recurrent problems with anxiety and um, couldn't get into their PCP for six weeks. And um, given the history of panic attacks, insomnia, irritability, et cetera, all the doc had to do was restart the SSRI that the patient had been taking, um, and then they were to follow up with their PCP as well. I like that there are three different examples here because it shows how these rapid response visits can be used, whether or not you actually have a hemorrhoid board um, primary care physician. Um, and we were able to serve the patient well and get them back to the appropriate um, care that they needed. Next slide, please. So going beyond asynchronous though, so when we started to go into video visits and, and we wanted, had this vision of doing video visits for all of our primary care docs, um, and we still have that vision, um, we came up against some barriers. Uh, one is that providers worried that patients would choose the video visits for inappropriate conditions. And so how we dealt with that, we said, well, okay, let's start by um, allowing the doc to choose virtual for a return visit. And it was one way to sort of ease them into this isn't that bad. So if you saw a person with hypertension or diabetes today and wanted them to follow up, the, uh, the, their next visit could be virtual. And as, as docs tiptoed into the waters that way, they started to give up that fear that it was, they were going to be used inappropriately and also get more comfortable with saying, hey, I think you need to be seen. Um, and now that we have a virtual exam kit, we have another option as well. But um, that's how we sort of eased into it. Um, now patients choose virtual themselves. They schedule themselves. We actually initially had been um, using blocks on the schedule um, that because docs were worried um, that if they ran behind with their in-person visits, the person who was waiting online would be upset. Um, and so we blocked time slots for, uh, at the beginning of sessions, right after lunch or first thing in the morning. And, and that, that worked fairly well, that we opened up the slots if they weren't used. But, but then patients started requesting, well, can I have virtual instead? And so they started flipping visits into virtual visits. Uh, so now they are scattered throughout uh, the schedule and patients are allowed to uh, slot themselves um, through my chart into what, whichever type of visit they want. Um, Providers were really worried about navigating the technology. You know, I, I'm, you know, I have no special expertise in informatics or virtual care or anything digital. I'm old school family medicine, but oversee a whole lot of docs. And I might have had this worry a little bit, but not as much as some of the docs that uh, that I oversee. But they were really worried about navigating the technology. What if they couldn't do it? What if it didn't connect right? You know, uh, I, I I haven't been exposed to it. What do I do here? So um, our virtual care team actually has a very high touch approach. Um, so the docs um, can be trained using just a, a video, but they also can be trained in person. And then when their first visit comes up, uh, that's virtual. So we're past the video visit thing now, and now we're starting to use the virtual exam kit for their first visit that utilizes a virtual exam kit. Um, the virtual care team reaches out to them and says, hey, doc, I noticed that you have this patient on your schedule. Do you feel comfortable? I want to walk through one. Let's do a fake one, et cetera. And the docs can even have somebody right, um, right with them um, as they initiate those, those first visits. Um, that high touch approach is also applied to patients. So we have um, MAs that are there to help uh, patients to set up their devices and to navigate the technology. And uh, we also have virtual rooming. And that, that's because docs were like, hey, you know, MAs help with, for us, MAs help with, the, with med rec, they tee up orders. They, we have a lot of standing orders in primary care. And they were really concerned that it was gonna be shifting work back to them that MAs had been helping them with. And so we um, actually just provide virtual rooming um, instead. And next slide, please. Despite that, and you can go one more, um, it was really the lack of physical exam 
that has limited provider adoption and, and it's for to us um, limited the use cases. So we think about, you know, okay, yes, there are a lot of things that you can do looking at a video. You know, you can look at the skin, you can see somebody's affect. Um, we've had people do some amazing things. We had a doc diagnose appendicitis just with video because he was very clinically astute and he knew how to, um, what to tell the patient to try to do in order to discern what was going on. Um, that said, you know, sometimes you just really need to listen to the lungs or listen to the heart, maybe look in the ears of that crying child, et cetera. And so that's basically why um, we decided to look into um, some kind of device that would help with, a, with an exam. Next slide, please. So a story to illustrate why we like this. So a, a 90 year old patient, this was one of our actual first um, virtual exam kit visits with one of our PCPs. So we had already done this with our MyCare on Demand doc. So they were using them, but this was one of our very first and probably our very first visit with a real PCP um, for continuity. So a 90, 90 year old patient had physical um, decline in her condition and she had to move in with her daughter 50 miles away. She was very upset about losing this PCP that she had this long-term relationship with. And uh, these are the situations where those relationships matter. So her daughter purchased a vir Henry Ford virtual exam kit and uses it um, to do virtual visits with the PCP that included an exam. The patient is extremely happy that she continued that trusted relationship. It supports the continuity of care, obviously minimizes change for that patient. Um, and doesn't have to inconvenience anybody to drive the 50 miles uh, to go to see and you know, do an in-person visit. Next slide, please. So prior to the device, this was basically what a virtual exam looked like. You know, if you wanted to look in the throat, you know, can you hold your phone up and say, ah, let me take a peek. Um, you know, certainly could look at look at skin and stuff like that as as um, as as I mentioned, but uh, next slide, please. So what do we mean when we say a device enabled exam? We, so it's a, a diagnostic device. You can see it's about the size of a um, tennis ball maybe. Um, it allows for the examination of heart and lungs, skin and abdomen. Um, you can check temperature, uh, ears, nose and throat. So live video feed. There's also store and forward um, a version that we haven't used yet, but has some possibilities. So you could take the, um, the, the patient can use the device, record the exam and forward it. And we have not enabled that uh, for, for our, our docs yet, but that's something that we could certainly do in the future. So there's a home version of this kit that the patients use uh, or their family members can use. And then in some situations like mobile integrated health or our um, uh, virtual home visiting physicians, et cetera, there's a care coordinator that acts as a telepresenter that is in the home. And then docs are on a computer and very soon we'll be able to do that from their smartphone as well. So an, an upgrade that we're getting in, in the near future just to make it easier for docs as well. And the next slide, please. So these are the attachments. So the device itself is there on the left. There's an otoscope, stethoscope, and tongue depressor. Uh, there are attachments that you can um, put into the tongue depressor and actually replace. Um, we tell people take, they can take a tongue depressor, uh, like just the plain wooden ones and um, break them in half and that works as well. So that what the patient sees on their phone is they actually see this ability to navigate. So the, their, their, their instructions uh, show up on the phone as you can see on the right. And next slide, please. There are also devices that can integrate with this. So the, um, and there are only specific devices at this time. So specific ohm run, blood pressure cuff and scale, a pulse oximeter, um, uh, I guess two options for the blood pressure cuff, but um, we, there are selected devices. Uh, there's also a dermoscope that's, um, that's available um, for, for folks who really want to do a lot of dermatology this way. Next slide. So one nice thing, I mean, people think, well, how easy is this to do? And, and the reason that we have telepresenters do it for some people is partly because it's hard for some people 
if they ha have cognitive decline or uh, limited physical skills. Um, it, it also could be hard if they don't have the right Wi-Fi access. Um, but mostly we have telepresenters um, when the person is so sick that they actually need additional assessment within the home um, and may need treatment as well. Uh, so there are uh, so for anybody else, it's really it's really uh, pretty 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 easy. Uh, so it comes with audio and visual instructions. Um, it comes with arrows that kind of uh, guide the person to uh, to uh, the the right area. Then when when they're there, they get a check mark. If they wanted to, they could take a snapshot, but they don't have to. If they're um, on with the physician, uh, the the doc will get the view. Um, every physician that's looked at these. Um, uh, you're looking at basically an ear, a tympanic membrane on a computer um, with optics that are amazing. The view is way better than when you're, when you're looking into that screaming child's um, uh, ear canal. And so uh, we've gained a lot of doctor acceptance just by them trying out the device and getting to see what the pictures look like. Next slide, please. So real quickly, we'll, we'll show how, um, how a throat exam works. So uh, we'll click on that video and you'll see. So it gives you some navigation. This is what it should look like. You see the, the you got it. The field, right? huh? Awesome. Next slide, please. So this is um, a patient who is connected to the doc and you're not gonna hear the audio. This is just the video, but we want you to see how, how it kind of works as the doc um, logs on, they start to talk and you can go ahead. And as they're talking, the doc can um, take control of the device. And this is really just to tell the person what to check next. So the doc is saying, okay, check the heart. Patient connects the uh, stethoscope. And then in front of her, she'll see on her screen this body of a person, and it shows where, where to put the device next. And record. That does require uh, headphones um, to, to really hear this well, but you can get very, really, really, very good um, heart and lung sounds through this. She's changing attachments to the otoscope attachment. Gonna check that left ear. And there's the picture. Now for us, we have this fully, oh, and the throat, sorry about that, throat again. For us, we have this um, totally integrated into Epic. So we do our notes in Epic, but um, there are people who use this and do their notes uh, right into this, this platform. She's doing temperature now, and the doc is about to add some notes. Great. You can go to the next slide. I think we might have, did we skip one? Yeah. There we go. All right, so mobile integrated health, what is it? I, I like this example because it's at the very opposite end of the continuum from the on-demand. Um, we have paramedics that are employed by us. We send them to the home uh, when a referral is made by a physician that could be an ED physician, a discharging physician, an outpatient physician. They go into the home, they evaluate even for social determinants. They've provided food boxes to patients when needed, but they connect with our physician uh, virtually. They use the device to do an exam when it's appropriate. The device is not always needed. Sometimes a phone contact with the doc is all that's needed. Um, and then under the direction of the uh, physician, the paramedics can provide treatments, um, diuresis, hydration, breathing treatments, IV antibiotics even. Uh, they can return and reevaluate the next day. Um, we actually were planning this pre-COVID and we were trying a discharge um, pilot pre-COVID where patients who were discharged from the hospital were seen um, using this, this, uh, this type of a process 
and the virtual visit was done with the discharging physician, that was really, really hard to coordinate. Now we're looking to be more on the front end. Um, and so this one is somebody's in the ED and the doc doesn't feel comfortable sending them home unless somebody's gonna check on them. They can avoid an observation. They can avoid um, an, um, an, in, an inpatient admission. A discharging physician can do the same thing. In our outpatient docs, when we found uh, people who've had uh, trouble, we can uh, send the paramedic out as well. Um, we are right now creating criteria so that our my care advice line nurses who are 24 seven can make referrals to MIH as well. And they're gonna launch on October 1st. They're extremely excited about this because the kinds of things that the paramedics can do are the kinds of things that'll keep people safe and at home um, and uh, uh, you know, very, very well cared for. And the only option for some of these people in the middle of the night otherwise would have been uh, to go to the ED. Next slide, please. So here's a couple of stories. This is one of our PCPs um, uh, it, right here in, in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Uh, a 70 year old patient, very sick, CKD stage three meningioma, causing some cerebellar compression had been treated with steroids and radiation and was recently hospitalized for cellulitis. The, the cellulitis caused diarrhea. I mean, the uh, uh, antibiotic caused diarrhea. He was having poor oral intake and the doc got a call on Saturday saying, hey, this guy's B1 is 100 and his creatinine is 3.5. Uh, he had the paramedic go out. The paramedic gave fluids. Uh, he left the line um, or the access in and returned um, several days. They can draw blood as well. I forgot, I forgot to tell you that part. Um, and they, they monitored the labs and vitals, adjusted the meds. And um, within a week, the patient were per, um, returned to baseline. Another one, um, not as intensely ill a person, but four family members with COVID, the father with comorbidities and the paramedic and the doc cared for the patient for all four patients on five occasions, mother and one of the daughters required fluids uh, several times uh, due to the GI effects of COVID and the decreased PO intake. Um, and uh, the, this, um, home, this, this uh, device was used um, to, um, to allow for an exam with the physician um, in this situation. So I think you can see this is different than when you're just gonna do it for yourself. It's really having the paramedics lay hands on and be able to give treatments is really helpful. Next slide, please. So when we decided to roll out this device enabled exam, um, as I mentioned, we started with the telepresenters, uh, a, a process using telepresenters and not a home version of the kit where you bought your own. So um, we started with those virtual home visiting physicians that doubled their ability to see patients. Um, and that we also at the same time launched this in school-based health uh, where the RN um, in the school um, is the telepresenter for a physician or nurse practitioner in, in another area. This was important to us from a mission basis because we do have a school-based health program. We have nurses in some schools and we have NPs in others, but we really wanted to be able to expand the reach of the program, especially within our Detroit public schools uh, where there was less access to healthcare. Uh, parents sign a form um, at the beginning of the year that allows uh, for this care to be provided. Uh, My Care at Work, same kind of thing. Um, we, the MA is on site. We talked about that before. And then we, uh, we started doing the mobile integrated health for those people with uh, high acuity needs at home. But how then, what happened next? You know, how did we move to um, using a home device that a person can purchase for themselves, use on themselves or their whole family. And that's what, uh, that was what came, came next. Next slide, please. So first we use this with My Care On Demand. Uh, it, it's, these are a group of docs who love to do virtual visits. They, um, they, they cover all hours of the day or night. And a person who purchases this, this device can make a choice to connect just by a regular video visit or connect um, with the device. Um, so the patient themselves are the telepresenter or their family member, depending on that patient's um, age and, and other issues. Um, 
and absolutely that went fine. No issues there. Our, um, our virtual MA team um, helped to make sure that people got connected um, quickly and that they uh, didn't have any trouble navigating their visits. Um, so then we rolled out to all our PCPs. We trained them all, but people forget because this is a slow process. We have, we have to get the devices into the hands of patients. It takes a while, they have to buy them. And so uh, everybody was worried, okay, what happens when one of these shows up on the schedule? Um, well, what the virtual team is actually um, combing the schedule. So when a physician has their first device enabled video visit, scheduled, they reach out to the provider and they walk them through it. Um, these are integrated into Epic, so it's just a click within Epic and the, and the visit is launched. Um, patients purchase this and the, the typical cost is a little bit less than $300. Um, this uh, device can be used on multiple family members, uh, so there's no limit. You want, want to use it on your friends, you could do that too. Uh, it's covered by um, health savings account or flexible spending account, um, so which is, uh, I think, a serious uh, benefit. Um, we have our virtual care team help the person pair the device just as soon as they purchase it, because if they don't pair the device when they are sick, they'll go back to what they normally do, what, uh, which some for some people is go to the ED. Um, so that's a really, really important first step. And the patients launch, launch their visit through, uh, through the, the Epic My Chart as well. What's not next for us in this regard is we're working with um, our development department. I guess philanthropy is out of favor. I shouldn't have put that. Um, but, but to get donor support for the device. I think, uh, I don't know about you folks, but you know, around Christmas time, I'll buy a goat or chickens or whatever to help sustain uh, families. It's the same kind of thing. People often like to know where their money is going. And we have a lot of families who would otherwise not be able to afford this. So if there are current patients of ours who meet certain criteria, we wanna be able to provide those devices to help them. Um, and since most of our, we do have some value-based contracts, but we're not deep into it the way the uh, virtual first clinic is that Dr. Sakamoto was talking about. Um, we aren't in a position to purchase these for our patients. So we're looking for, uh, for donor support um, to do that. Next slide, please. So what are our lessons? Um, you know, per virtual care can be very personal. We've had patients so grateful in tears, sometimes with the doc they know, sometimes not with the doc they know. Um, sometimes it was our behavioral, uh, behavioral health. That integration into the EHR is really critical for providers. Um, otherwise, you know, if I, you have to go to another website, click on a different place, uh, we, we, we are met with more uh, resistance. It's also safer for patients. That integration across the continuum, it's really our secret sauce. It makes, it, it makes us a differentiator. It makes us different than some of the companies who just do virtual and just do virtual urgent care. Um, uh, just knowing that we're integrated. And patients choose us for that reason um, because we are trusted. Um, that technology can make or break the experience, but that personal navigation really helps. Uh, it helps to go overcome di technological barriers as well as digital literacy. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess never underestimate the effort required to change clinicians' behavior. It really took a long time. Um, and we can design with equity in mind. And there's one more I probably didn't put on here. It's like, you know, there are myths out there about virtual care and some of those myths are things like older people won't do it. I have an 89 year old patient who can do this. Um, I'm sure others do as well. So um, for, <laughs> we have to kind of keep ageism out of this um, and, um, and, and know that we can really make this available um, to, to pretty much anybody, um, if we can help them navigate past some of the barriers that may, they may um, they may have, there are a couple more slides in the appendix. Which, um, when you get these slides, you can look at yourself. It's how to, how we put a couple of our programs into that return on health framework, and a little bit of our uh, statistics for our mobile integrated health, which actually has, is seeing very low income um, and very high minority percentages, um, right right in the heart. And I. Do believe that's it and I want to thank you for your attention. I, 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 I appreciate this, the opportunity to talk about Henry Ford. I'm proud of what we do but um, 
I am by no means um, an expert in, in anything except leading a bunch of docs. And uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate being able to share that with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. George. Incredible presentation and incredible work. Um, I echo Dr. Sakamoto's mentioned here, you know, just in incredibly inspiring from many facets. I think like you have an incredible portfolio of virtual care offerings and um, the, you know, embedding just RPM technology into your integrating that into your HR. That's something that we're hearing a lot of. Um, from physicians that are interested in furthering their telehealth programs. So I think hopefully that's given some just insight on what's out there and how to integrate that and some of the challenges. Um, let's see, Dr. Sakamoto, if you're on, I'd love for just you to pop on and ask your question around um, financial support. Yeah, no, for sure. This is, I, like I said, I was looking forward to this. I, it exceeded expectations. This was amazing. Um, but I think from my um, standpoint, thinking through like, I guess, where did you get sort of the, financial and like internal political will to really do this kind of transformative work because this is head and shoulders above almost every organization I've seen um, so I guess kind of yeah, where did that <laughs> where did that seed come from from that standpoint force of will um, <laughs> you know um, are, are you actually asking about sort of all of our telehealth stuff that we're doing in primary care or are you talking about the device integration specifics kind of, kind of more of the all the stuff you're doing because I mean it, I can tell there is a um bigger vision and like a you know like like you said you're using this as a differentiator um so is this kind of coming from like like a you know design and innovation group is this coming from uh just primary care leadership kind of you know where where is this drive coming from just yeah, there clearly yeah. is one yeah good question um we at henry ford are um we're used to we're used to having very few resources and so what for the length of time that I've been with Henry Ford, we always try to, we, we think with lean, we use lean principles and we try to figure out how can we do something um, uh, better and easier. And we also, you know, we embraced virtual care actually back in around 2007, prior to us even going on Epic, we had a homegrown EMR and we had, um, we partnered with a, a company that actually integrated e-visits into our EMR. They were amazing e-visits, quite frankly. They, the, the branching logic was super. And so when we went on to Epic, sorry to Epic, but we were, we were not happy with the e-visits we had in Epic. So we started to create, then create our own e-visits within Epic. So I actually think it's just our culture. Um, I think it's the culture, um, not so much of HFMG overall, though HFMG overall is very into innovation but also very tertiary quaternary focused. And, um, but our culture and primary care is also very focused on innovation and it's innovation you know, within, uh, within our world. Uh, so I, I think it's, that's probably all it is. Uh, we, we just saw that we could do something differently. Um, we do not have the resources. We don't use the resources of an innovation team per se. I have a think tank team that I pulled together that helps with thinking some of these things through. But we have highly motivated leaders that help to create the on-demand program and highly motivated leaders working on the uh, mobile integrated health. And then, um, and then we, we look, okay, how do we make sure, we, together we look at how do we make sure that, we, um, that we're doing what's safe and clinically appropriate and, and, nab and integrated into the continuum. And I, I guess it's really not, I wish I could tell you, I wish I could provide for you a structure that says do it this way. Have people doing this, this, and this, and this. Uh, but I just, we just don't have it. Um, we don't, we don't have it. But I have absolutely great team members who do lots of, lots of jobs um, within their, within their scopes and beyond their scopes, actually. So, anything great. else? Dr. George, so I just want to call out. I know we had a question here around. Um, I think it was, you know, how much is a virtual the virtual visit kit cost and is this covered by insurance? So you did answer that question during your presentation mentioning that it's covered, you know, by from HSA accounts or FSA accounts that individuals can use and you've got, you know, philanthropic arms of um, Henry Ford that potentially can contribute to that, but it is purchased by the patient themselves and yeah. yep. they bring that to the visit. Um, we also so just, had though, I forgot to mention, um, payroll deduction. So for all of our Henry Ford employees, they can purchase a device using payroll deduction so they can, you know, pay it off uh, $10 a pay or whatever until it's until it's gone. 
we also have been able to offer various specials that take down the price and then um, and then gift cards for after people um, pair their device and those kinds of things. Got it, really helpful. Um, so I, there's a question that came through around um, just the data, right? So you've integrated it with your EHR. Can you talk a little bit more about, is this continuous transferring of data? Is this a one-time transferring of data? Like how does that data collection happen? And um, have you, has, there, has there been any demonstrated value through outcomes and or cost that you've realized through this experience? Yeah, so we are not at the point where we have like a continuous device integration. We, we'd like to get there so that you can do that remote monitoring kind of thing. The device integration, the integration in our EMR and the transfer of information really comes during the visit or while the, while the uh, device is being used. And we have chosen usually to not store that information in the EHR, but we can if we want. So if you wanna take a picture of something that can be stored in the EHR, but for the most part, we're not because we don't want to be, well, when you see a person in it, when you see somebody in person, you don't record every element of the visit in terms of the, the heart sounds in the picture. You, you record it in terms of, of uh, your note saying what you see. So we didn't want to collect unnecessary data in that sense. Um, so that's, but that's what I meant by integration. Um, in terms of keeping people out of the hospital, um, in terms of satisfaction, some of those data are on the, um, on the slides in the appendix, but uh, this is re both actually my care on demand as well as um, rapid response e-visits and uh, mobile integrated health have kept a lot of people out of the ED um, and kept them from getting, um, getting readmitted. And so we do have, for the patients that we've touched, um, we have a decreased ED utilization. Um, additionally, our equity numbers are really good, you know, so we, we've designed in a way that helps us to capture the right populations and not skew towards people who've got money or people who are, you know, or, uh, in, in um, well-off zip codes or that sort of thing. Um, so we've seen that kind of benefit. I don't think it's law, uh, and then our, our net promoter scores are good, that kind of, they're great actually, um, that kind of thing we're doing well on. Um, I don't think that we have enough visits to say yet for all 400,000 of the patients who are aligned to us, we've cut the, the ED use rate this much, but for the patients that we've touched, um, we have definitely avoided that they would have had to have gone to the ED if they, if they had not um, been able to uh, have these services. So. Um, probably one of those things to come back when we've touched more patients and we'll continue, we continue to monitor that. We, 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 um, we are collecting the data as we speak. Absolutely. Um, I think question back to, um, you know, what Dr. Sakamoto is asking around just like your entire portfolio for context. Can you just help people understand, um, like, when did you start? rolling out some of these programs, like just for some contextual purposes, maybe when did you um, start rolling out the, the Taito Care Tech or the Henry Ford virtual exam kit technology? Um, just again, I think, you know, everyone's very eager and excited to integrate these things. And, um, you know, what's like a realistic time frame to kind of in, in a, for planning purposes, should they be expecting or can they expect? And I know we've got several people joining from larger health systems as well. Yeah. It, it it depends. Um, so I actually am seeing that I didn't completely answer Dr. Sakamoto's question uh, about finances. So we can come back to that if you, if at some point, if you want. Um, asynchronous e-visits we started doing in 2007, back in our old EHR. Uh, we charged a small amount of money to patients um, to do it. It was like I think $30 at that time. They weren't being covered by most insurance companies, um, but patients chose to do it still. So, um, and then we realized we started getting payment from insurance companies, so we stopped charging the patient and we started billing insurance companies up front um, and then only charge the patient otherwise. With our current EVIS, we do the same thing. Um, so EVIS, we have a very long history, but rapid response e-visits far and away. Um, basically, that took, we had an, a pool of on-demand docs. We said, look, that pool, 
you know, whoever's, they're not doing on-demand video visits that whole time. And um, Dr. Sakamoto mentioned this, asynchronous, you can squeeze that in, right? Uh, nope, not his words, but mine, you know, you, that, that's that asynchronous work, you can work that into your schedule pretty easily. Um, so we turned that on and people grabbed it and it went, there, there was nothing to that, nothing to that at all, except having the docs who were going to we're, we're watching the pool, you know, so where did the, where did the e-visits land and then grabbing them as, as they came in. And, um, and then the, 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 our, our internal Epic team just building that ability for somebody who selected a rapid response e-visit for that to go to this pool instead of going to that person's PCP. That was the absolute fastest rollout of anything we've ever had. Um, the MyCare on demand, on demand video visits. Um, we launched, let me think, um, late 2019, I want to say. And we were covering sort of normal business hours kind of thing. No, uh, yeah, it was, I want to say normal business hours. Maybe it was the flip. I'd have to go back and look. Um, but yeah, we definitely weren't covering the weekends. Then COVID hit and Within a week, we covered 24 seven. We flipped it to 24 um, seven and got very, very busy. And um, kudos to Dan Passerman, he's probably not on here, but he just, he figured out how to um, get docs to sign up and we paid them in various ways. So some people it's part of their FTE, some people it's like a, um, a backup call fee and then a per visit fee. You know, we, we figured out ways to get people to engage in that, um, but really, figured out how to do 24 seven within a week's time when, when um, the shutdowns from COVID hit. Um, and then it got, it got wildly popular. So that one was different. Well, the difference, what, you know, if, if you're using virtual with a group of physicians who like it and are engaged and you can get the build done, you can do it pretty quickly. The trickiest part is getting continuity care docs, you know, docs who are used to in-person thinking about how can they do things virtually. Um, and so that that's trickier. Mobile Integrated Health is also a, a group of people who are think innovatively. They're people who are used to taking care of complexly ill patients, uh, love the idea of being able to do that from the home. And so um, that actually wasn't that hard either. We, we um, sort of flipped that and turned that on. We had the, we had the, bones, sort of the back, the, we had the uh, foundations built because we were doing this uh, emergency disposition and support pilot where the ED docs would send patients to the home, would send paramedics to the home. And we just, we took that structure and we, um, we, we created something bigger and better out of it, um, allowing more docs to refer into that. And that was a COVID response. Um, it was wow, we've got to take care of more people. We've got to get them out of the hospital faster. How can we innovate something really quickly? And now, and now we've tweaked it. And, and um, so with that one, the hardest thing is about changing frontline docs behavior. So if you have never had the opportunity to refer to a mobile and graded health, have a paramedic go to the home, when you're speaking with the physician or your nurse, I mean, a patient or your nurse is speaking with a patient, you might first think you need to go to the ED. But once you're aware of mobile integrated health and then you make a referral to mobile integrated health, then the next time you're going to think more easily of mobile integrated health. So that doctor, that, that patient that, that um, I shared a story about um, with the CKD and the dehydration, uh, the doc that oversees our mobile integrated health works in that clinic. And so when his partner had this patient, he said, you need to do this. Um, and that and collecting and sharing those stories actually helps, but then you have to get the word out over and over and over and over again um, until people try it. Once they try it, they're fine with it. Um, our virtual care um, was a very slow rollout. And I think with physicians, we started rolling out into our clinics probably, it might've even been 2018, just as, uh, and it was just, slow with some people saying, you can't make me do that. And then um, patients wanting it and then COVID hit and everybody wanted it. Um, and so uh, it really, it broke down a lot of barriers. Um, I think that the hardest ones are really the ones where you're trying to get 
a lot of primary care docs to think differently. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's super helpful. Really appreciate it. And then if you want to touch on just the financial piece, um, we've got some time. Yeah, okay. So so um, I mentioned how we got the e-visits paid for in the beginning. Um, we actually partnered with a health plan in the beginning, and they, they said, for your contract, we'll cover these um, because they wanted to help us innovate. innovate. Um, and now, uh, now obviously, more, more contracts do. We're in this tough place between value and volume where we want to perform the value, but a lot of the payments still volume or the value-based dollars come in after the fact. And then when you're in a big health system, how do you, how do you take those dollars and actually invest them? So really it has to do with the leadership in our system that they, they understand and understood the need to invest in these things, even if initially it might look like we're losing money, even if initially um, you know, we're not seeing an ROI because uh, they're, they're kind of low cost to implement, but ultimately can be very, very high value. So we have uh, leadership within Henry Ford Health System that, that um, was really committed to letting us go ahead and try these things um, and then look at the finances later. And so, which is really saying something when you have a very low margin, like Henry Ford, you know, being in Detroit, it's one of the worst markets. We've got a very low margin. Uh, so it really says something that our system will, um, our system leaders will support us in that way. That's and great. I know we're fortunate. We can't, I, I, I don't. I don't underestimate the value of, of that. And, um, you know, people in private practice or or in other systems may not feel that kind of benefit, but we definitely have it here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. The mission focus and mission, right? Just being front and center is, is really clear in your presentation. And I think that's a great way to end today's session today. Um, thank you. I just want to say again, thank you so much to Dr. Waldron, Dr. Sakamoto, and Dr. George for joining us. Thank you all for um, participating in the telehealth immersion program. We hope that um, just by sharing these case studies, you have some just insight and um, some information that can help you further telehealth and virtual care in your organizations as well. So with that, um, I just want to share that um, our next pre or our next boot camp session is coming up. Um, as part of this program, the AMA will host a mini boot camp to wrap up the American Telemedicine Association Telehealth Awareness Week. Um, during the session, participants will have the opportunity to discuss health at home models and strategies and dive deeper into telehealth use. Um, we've got two breakout sessions, OBGYN and renal medicine nephrology, um, where we'll specifically have conversations around telehealth use in those medical specialties. Um, this event is designed to engage various stakeholders to support long-term sustainable telehealth programs across the industry. And we in invite everyone to join us on sat Saturday, September 25th um, from 10 to 1230. And you can register on our website at www.ama-assn.org um, www slash telehealth immersion. Thank you all so much. Um, we hope you have a great day.